Today we'll look into how effective Molotov cocktails are against modern tanks or to be more specific against modern Russian armored fighting vehicles. There are several reasons for this focus. First, to minimize the scope since every minute of video you see takes about 1 to 3 hours of work. Second, it also seems that western designs are less optimized in that regard. And third, current interest and coverage of this topic since most of what I read so far was rather superficial. To go a bit deeper, I had Tankolat to do a 5000 word report on firefighting systems. Specifically the ZS11-3 and the ZS13-1 which are used in the T-72s, the T-80s and the upgraded version of the T-72, the T-90. They are also similar to the one used in the T-64. So we look at the most important tanks that are used in the Russia-Ukrainian war right now. We also look at the BMP-2 and the BTR-80. Of course, later in the video we will also discuss non-material aspects like moral effect as well. We are aware this is only my analysis based on studying military history and technology. I never served in combat, nor do I have military experience beyond boot camp as a conscript in the Austrian Armed Forces. Anyway, let's look at the basics. A Molotov cocktail is a bottle filled with a highly flammable liquid, usually a mixture of gasoline with other flammable liquids that has a burning cloth or some other mechanism involved that ignites the liquid once the bottle shatters, usually upon impact on the intended target. Technically this can be called incendiary bottles or improvised incendiary devices. The name Molotov cocktail goes back to the Soviet Finnish Winter War from 1939 to 1940. Back then the Soviet foreign minister was Molotov. Yet against tanks these weapons were already used in the Spanish Civil War or even before. Anyway, with interwar and World War II tanks these weapons had various effects, namely depending on the quality of the welding and hatches the burning liquid could enter directly into the crew compartment. Also division devices like periscopes sometimes had sealing problems as well. Additionally, if the engine deck was hit the liquid could enter into the engine compartment and damage the engine, as discussed in my video on how to kill a tiger tank. So leading to a mobility kill but also setting the tank on fire as well. Of course, one could argue while well, this was the same with post-World War II tanks. While it is not that easy, particularly for Soviet post-war tanks, there seems to be a major design change. Tankolat, who wrote the research report and various articles about Soviet tanks based on Soviet primary sources, has the impression that already T-54 was well protected against Molotov cocktail attacks. I assume this is related to the Soviet experience during the Second World War. Probably also due to the Soviet experience in the Hungarian uprising in 1956 and the Prague Spring in 1968, where Molotov cocktails were used against Soviet tanks. Additionally, sealing and auto measures likely improved with the T-55, since it was an upgraded T-54 with a nuclear protection system. Additionally, most Soviet armored vehicles were capable of crossing a river in one way or another. Again, this means that there are mechanisms and design choices for better sealing a tank. But more importantly engines need air. This means there must be some way that the tank engine get air at least for a short while. Be aware, at first we look mainly at the material effectiveness against specific vehicles. So we assume a buttoned up vehicle, so hatch is closed. Additionally we assume maintained and fully operational vehicles. In the second part we look also at different scenarios and the moral effect for both the tank crews and the Molotov cocktail operators. So let us look at the T-72 and T-90 first. Newer models of the T-72, basically from the T-72BA modification onward and the T-90s as well have the ZS-13-1 firefighting system, which is also used in the T-80U. The system covers several aspects, fighting fires in the engine compartment and an explosion suppression system in the crew compartment. The whole system comes with sensors like thermal and optical sensors an interface and other features. The system was supplemented also with a portable fire extinguisher. The system has an automatic mode which is the default but should certain elements fail the crew can intervene to discharge the extinguishing system manually as well. I won't go into any details about the complete setup here. One major upgrade to the previous system, the ZS11-1, was the addition of OD1 optical sensors. These are infrared photo detectors that are sensitive to short wave infrared emissions, so something an open flame would produce. This is similar to systems used in the M1 Abrams and Leopard 2. 
One particular benefit of such a system is that it can detect the flame of a fuel explosion in its very early stage. As such, it is possible to discharge an extinguishing agent into the fuel cloud before it completely explodes. Although be aware that this system does not help against ammunition fires nor ammunition explosions. In that sense, not much has changed in the Second World War. To quote a German pamphlet from 1943 for the instructions of a Sturmgeschütz crew, in the event of a carburetor fire, the loader must shut off the fuel supply, then turn the engine as high as possible to empty the carburetor. A fire on the bottom of the hull looks very bad at first. Keep calm, no immediate danger, extinguish with a fire extinguisher, sand and water. In case of fire caused by enemy action, switch off the engine immediately if possible, if you don't have to take cover first. To prevent the fire from spreading quickly, get out immediately and extinguish the fire. If cartridges have caught fire, there is no rescue. Disembark, run away. Well, back to the matter at hand. A short look at the extinguishing system. It comes with four bottles, two are used in the crew compartment and two in the engine compartment. They use Halon 1301 as agent and to increase pressure the bottles also have nitrogen chambers as well. One important aspect to mention is that in the late 1970s and early 1980s, the Soviets upgraded the various tanks including the old T-55s with the Soda Napalm protection system. From what we know, this is not a single kit but a combination of various elements. To name some components, fine mesh screens on air intakes. These prevent the fluids like napalm that are thicker than fuel from leaking in. Steel pipes around external wires and asbestos lined steel pipes for hoses on external fuel tanks. Of course, the fine meshes won't work against Molotov cocktails since fluids used in those are usually not particularly thick. Yet in general, various components of the tanks are hardened against fire. Yet from the design, the burning liquid could still not enter directly the engine via the air intake, since the T-72 air cleaner is constructed in such a way that air is sucked in from the side and does not enter directly from the top. The liquid would run down into the engine compartment and collect there, yet from what we know, there are no exposed wires nor flammable hydraulic lines on the floor. The extinguishing system would be triggered, but generally such an attack would not be fatal under regular circumstances. Of course, one could argue that Molotov cocktail attacks can also be used to obscure the vision of the tank crew. The major issue is that various vision devices have one or more cleaning measures that likely would negate that. The glass windows of the side housing and the housing of the rangefinder optic both feature aerosol and air jet cleaning systems. The side housing window has both a high pressure aerosol cleaning system and a mechanical wiper that is manually actuated by the gunner via a small rod. The rangefinder optic window only has the aerosol cleaning system, lacking a wiper. Generally an attack with a smoke grenade or even blanket might be an alternative option. They are both also quite resistant to various cleaning systems and wipers. A short summary for the T-72 and T-90 tanks. But this information should also apply to the T-80, T-64, T-62 and T-55 with a few exceptions. For instance a different firefighting system. An attack with a Molotov cocktail on a button-up tank likely would have little effect, assuming all systems are functional and the crew does not panic. Several well-placed hits on the engine compartment might deplete the halon storage for the extinguishing system there. Yet we should not forget that Molotov cocktails are also inherently dangerous to the operators themselves. If the intention is to obscure the vision of the crews, other methods depending on the circumstances might be better, like smoke grenades or in some instances even mere blankets since those are less dangerous to the operators as well. For instance, if you drop a blanket, you probably won't hurt yourself. Be aware that moral effects will be covered in a later section that is independent of the particular vehicles. Next up are infantry fighting vehicles. For this we look particularly at the BMP-2, which is an improved version of the BMP-1. The BMPs, like tanks, had protection against nuclear, biological and chemical agents. The BMP-1 is protected against radioactive and chemical biological contamination, it can be hermetically sealed by closing and locking all hatches and it uses an air filtration system bolstered by an air overpressure system to keep out contaminants. 
The BMP2 is far less protected than the T72 in several ways. Besides the lower armor, the firefighting system is also limited. The automatic fire extinguishing system is only installed in the engine compartment. It operates on four TD1 thermal sensors placed strategically around the engine to ensure a higher chance of prompt detection. On paper, at least. There are two 5 liter fire extinguishers containing halon carbon agent 114B connected to the automatic fire extinguishing system. Additionally, there are also handheld carbon dioxide fire extinguishers in the passenger compartment. About obscuring the vision, both the BMP1 and BMP2 have a jet washer for the driver's front facing periscope. The BMP is also an amphibious vehicle, as such, it has various protections from liquids entering the engine exhaust or air intakes. Due to the shape of the duct, the angle of the exhaust vents, and the constant supply of exhaust from a running engine, there is effectively no danger of engine flooding from natural sources of water ingress, including rain and waves, when the BMP is swimming. Water is not allowed to pool at the bottom of the duct, as the flow of air will rapidly blow it out. Similarly, flaming liquids such as burning fuel do not have an entry point to the drivetrain. If the engine stops and the flow of exhaust gases ceases, the engine is protected by exhaust manifold valves. As such, the BMP2 and likely the BMP1 and BMP3 as well should be mostly safe against Molotov cocktail attacks. Since the exhaust design is the same with the BMP1 and the anti flooding measure were also used in the BMP3. Additionally, the BMP3 has an automatic system as well. The BMP3 uses the INE automated fire detection and extinguishing system with coverage in the engine compartment and the crew compartment. Finally, a look at the BTR 80 here. Since for this one, the official Facebook account of the general staff of the Armed Force of Ukraine provided an infographic on where to hit it with Molotov cocktails. Note, the infographic shows a BTR 82A, which is an upgraded version of the BTR 80. Likely, there are no significant changes in regard to our question. The infographic points out as targets the tires, the driver's windscreen, the various hatches, the gun turret, and the engine deck. It should be noted, although, that on the infographic, the tires are targeted with spikes, not a Molotov cocktail, so we'll skip them. About the windscreen, when combat becomes imminent, the driver must switch to an array of three TNPO 115 periscopes mounted on the ceiling, supplemented by another TNPO 115 periscope on the side of the hull. Sometimes during production run of the BTR-80, a fourth TNPO 115 periscope was added to the hull ceiling to further improve the driver's visibility towards the left, which makes sense given that the USSR and most of the world drove on the right side of the road. As such, it is questionable if an attack on the windscreen is particularly useful. Note that the center periscope has a wiper, but not a jet cleaning system, and the question is how fire resistant that wiper is. The hatches, if closed, should be mostly safe, since the BTR-80 has good leak protection features. This should prevent any liquids from entering if properly sealed and maintained. A Molotov hit on the gun turret likely would lead to obscuring the vision of the gunner. The turret itself has no hatch and is well sealed, but the continuous fire might damage or set off the smoke grenades on the turret, which would likely blind the gunner. Tankorat also noticed an interesting feature for the turret that was added on the BTR-80s from 1985 onward. On the turret is a special port that allows to connect the fire extinguisher, which should allow the gunner to extinguish fires on the hull roof without leaving the vehicle. About the engine deck, as with previous vehicles, this should be less of an issue. Like the BMP, the BTR is an amphibious vehicle. The air intake for the engine is located on the hull roof, just in front of the engine access panel and behind the starboard passenger roof hatch. The inlet is covered by a dome to prevent accidental water intake from rain and from waves when the vehicle is swimming in a body of water. When it comes to the firefighting system, the BTR-80 has an automatic firefighting system for the engine compartment, but not for the crew compartment. Here handheld extinguishers are used, so similar to the BMP-2. After the technical side, we need of course look at the moral side of things. Unlike in movies and computer games, this factor is far more important in war than commonly portrayed. To give you an example about the second war war after the campaign against Poland, the German forces noted about their bombing attacks the following. Interestingly, the Luftwaffe commentators were willing to admit that the material effects of such attacks were not impressive. Rather, it was the impact on the enemy morale that resulted in significant accomplishments. 
In combat, suppressing the enemy is basically about preventing the enemy from using his weapon effectively. So it is not necessary to destroy equipment or kill the enemy, unlike seen in most movies or usually necessary in computer games. Even though a Molotov cocktail might not be able to destroy most tanks, it is definitely a very unpleasant experience for the crew. Furthermore, one major weakness of tanks is the limited visibility. A Molotov cocktail attack forces the crew to button up. This decreases the combat effectiveness in many ways. Spotting targets, communicating with nearby troops like infantry, evading obstacles or even mines and avoiding ambushes. Particularly in urban combat, a buttoned up tank easily becomes a sitting duck. Of course, rifle fire and other weapons will usually lead the crew to button up already at longer ranges. But bullets travel in a straight line and don't run down in your tank like burning fuel. As such, a Molotov cocktail hit creates a different suppression scenario than a regular rifle fire. Furthermore, nobody wants to get burned. As such, the suppression value of Molotov cocktails can be considered high. And since they are silent, they are also a rather stealthy weapon, unless thermal imaging is used. But this accounts only for already burning cocktails and assumes the imaging system is directed at the operator, which is unlikely if they approach from the sides. Another aspect about the moral effect is that the Molotov cocktail is basically the weapon of the underdog. Anyone that is forced or feels forced to use a Molotov cocktail against a high-tech weapon like a tank is probably not holding back. As such, the use of the weapon likely gives the feeling of empowerment to the operator for better or worse. Of course, it should be noted that even making a Molotov cocktail is quite a dangerous business, let alone using it, especially in a combat or a similar situation. The feeling of empowerment should also not be confused with the actual power or control. Also, my assessment might be terribly wrong and really is dependent on the circumstances. To summarize, first, on the technical level, Molotov cocktails against modern Russian tanks have a limited or even a very limited effectiveness. Yet on a moral level, these weapons can be effective. They can force tank crews to button up or at least be distracted and thus allow more effective weapons the chance to engage weak spots on the tanks, exploit weaknesses caused by distraction or by time for the defenders. Additionally, it also sends a clear symbol to all sides. The attackers, the defenders and the watchers that the defenders are willing to go all the way. Big thank you here to Tankolat for providing a research report on the firefighting systems of the T-72 and T-90, as well as answering a lot of questions surrounding the topic and providing very valuable corrections to the script. With him this video would not have been possible. Thank you to Tech Arrow and Alex for various discussions and additional information. Thank you to Andrew for reviewing the script. And special thanks to Chris from Military Aviation History for suggesting this topic. Special thanks to all my supporters for making trips to museums and military archives possible. As always, source the list in the description. Thank you for watching and see you next time.